My new book, One by One, is set in the exclusive French skiing resort of Saint Antoine, where the chairman and shareholders of Snoop, the hottest new streaming app around, are gathering to discuss a make or break buyout that could make some of them millionaires and leave others out in the cold. When an avalanche cuts the group off from help and some members of the company go missing in the snow, they're forced to ask, would someone resort to murder to get what they want? It's really hard for me to pin down um, one particular inspiration. I guess I've always wanted to do a kind of Christie-ish and then there were none sort of novel with people being kind of picked off one by one in a remote location. Um, my books don't tend to have very high body counts in comparison <laughs> to some writers. Um, so this book is maybe less typical for me in that respect in that there are quite a few deaths. I don't think that's a spoiler. Um, in terms of the setting, I love skiing. I'm not particularly good. Um, but a few years ago, um, some friends and I went to Val d'Isère, which has this incredible um, ski, well, it's not even a ski run, really. It's sort of semi-off-piste um, called the Valle Perdu, the Lost Valley. Um, and I'd never skied this run, and my friends took me down it. It was incredibly beautiful, but also really, really scary getting down to it because there'd been a heavy dump of snow, so you couldn't get to it by the usual route, and you had to kind of ski off-piste down this really sort of scary mountainside. Um, it was a fantastic experience. It was an amazing day out, but it was also one of the scarier things that I've ever done. And I found myself thinking what an amazing set piece it would make in a novel or a film, you know, someone skiing down this kind of really narrow valley with all the sort of twists and turns. Um, I'm not sure if I can really say that that was the germ for the setting, um, but it definitely found its way into the novel, as you will see if you read it. Um, and it probably did contribute to me deciding that a ski chalet would be a really fun place to set a thriller. People always ask me how I plot my books and I always feel like I should have, you know, some really complicated writerly answer involving like colour coordinated index cards or special software or, you know, whiteboards or something. Um, and the truth is, I don't. I do know a lot of people who work that way. Um, some of them use software apps like Scrivener to help them keep track of stuff. I have one friend who has this incredible method with a roll of wallpaper where she like plots the whole thing as a kind of timeline and has all the characters kind of laid out. And I don't, I don't do any of that. Um, the way I work is I've usually been thinking about the beginning of the book for quite a long time before I begin. Um, so I generally know like the, the kind of the characters and the setting and the, the place where I'm starting pretty well when I start. Um, so for the turn of the key, that was, you know, a woman who's in prison um, and she's trying to persuade her lawyer that she's innocent. Um, for one by one, it was a group of very troubled company executives meeting in a ski chalet in the middle of nowhere and they're trying to kind of thresh out a buyout offer which is going to make some of the millionaires and others of them will lose out. Um, so I knew that that was the kind of the core that I wanted to explore. Um, and I knew who did it. <laughs> I won't tell you who, obviously. Um, but I think, for me anyway, that's really important for writing a thriller because I always feel like the ideal whodunit is a book where you get to the end and you think, of course, of course, I should have known. I had all the clues, I had all the information and I just didn't put it together. Um, but in order to give the reader all of that information, I have to know it beforehand. So I feel like I have to give people a fair chance of guessing the outcome. And part of that is sort of seeding those clues throughout the narrative. Um, but for the rest of it, I kind of make it up as I go along. And the way I always think of it is it's a little bit like a journey. Like I know where I'm starting. I know quite a lot about that because that's the place where I am right now and I know roughly where I want to get to, but the exact route that I take and what I see along the route is kind of up for grabs. And it's part of what keeps me interested, truthfully. Um, so I write exactly in the order that you read it. Um, I, some writers write out of sequence, but I can't do that. I have to be able to keep track of the sort of the tension and who knows what and, and where we are in the narrative. Um, 
and I literally just make it up <laughs> as I go along. Um, I wish I had a fancy answer because the truth is that every time I sit down to write a new book, I really struggle to remember how I did it last time. And I think, you know, how am I going to plot these twists? Where is this going to come from? How am I going to fool the reader? So if I had a fancy method, I feel like maybe it would reassure me that I can do it again. Um, but I don't. I, it's literally a case of I make it up as I go along and I wish there was a better answer. <laughs> I do always know who the murderer is, um, but I do occasionally change my mind about some important aspects. Not usually who did it, but sometimes some aspect about why or how or what their motive was. Um, and this book was a tough one with motive um, in ways that I can't really talk about without <laughs> spoiling it. Um, but my characters do often surprise me and I think that's because um, when you start a book, you hopefully know your characters pretty well, but you get to know them better and better as the novel unfolds because you basically, you spend a year inside the head of these people getting to know them and they're talking to you and they're telling you stuff about their past and their background. And sometimes that has a really radical effect on who they are and why they've taken the actions that they have. Um, so that can change quite a lot. And a couple of my books, the ending has been a complete surprise to me. Um, I won't say which ones because it's a, it's a bit of a spoiler in some cases. Um, but one of my books in particular, a major character was supposed to die. And when I got to that page, I just couldn't write it. It was just the wrong ending. Um, and the ending that wrote itself was completely different to the one that I'd planned. And then I had to go back and kind of wreck on the rest of the book to make that possible, uh, which was a challenge. Um, and I get emails from readers about it. I think it's one of the favorite endings of all of my books. So it's definitely, it's satisfying to kind of play with my own expectations and surprise myself. My book's a funny one because I don't tend to have to do a whole lot of technical research. There's, you know, there's usually some aspects of policing or law that I have to figure out. Um, but usually the kind of the, the crux of my books is something about the human heart. And I feel that being, you know, a, a human myself and a woman in the 21st century, that's something that I kind of, I can only research by sort of thinking about myself. Um, but certainly with this book, I went into um, something that I'd never written about before, which was the kind of this sort of tech startup business sort of side of things. Um, I've never worked in a, in a tech company. Um, I've used a lot of apps. I don't know if that, <laughs> that's a particular qualification. Um, but I had great fun reading a lot of books about what it was like to start up a, a kind of a small startup, um, listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, and Snoop, the company in the book, is most definitely not based on any of the companies that I read about, uh, thank God. Um, but the pressures that they're under, I think, are really quite universal to lots of small companies, um, particularly tech ones, where things can grow and kind of spiral out of control very quickly. You know, there's a lot of money sloshing around in the tech world, or there can be. Um, and often these things spiral like super quickly. You get investors on board, you get shareholders who are kind of impoverished students one day and then just a few years later, they are the CEO of what's actually become a fairly major company. And that is, it's a huge lifestyle change. It's a lot to come to terms with just on a personal level, let alone the kind of the learning curve involved in terms of managing people and running a company and talking to investors and all of those sorts of pressures that the fact that you have a great idea for an app doesn't necessarily equip you to deal with all of those things. Um, so it was really, it was really interesting just from a kind of a human nature perspective to read about people who had gone through that kind of intense learning curve, that sort of naught to 60 experience of waking up one day as someone with a cool idea and then, you know, a few short months later being at the kind of the centre of a sort of whirlwind of shares and investors. Um, and that was fascinating. And that really, um, 
it kind of goes to the heart of what Snoop are going through as a company and what all the people involved are trying to come to terms with. <laughs>